everyone to another episode of Libby Chat, episode eight. We're already two months into this and I can see people are in the chat box saying hi already. Brian and Sandra, hi. Um, another very excellent episode with a little bit of a twist today because as you can see, we've got a, we don't have David Limbrick, but we do have our two regular uh, panellists here. My name is Kirsty O'Sullivan, but we have Campbell Newman up there in Queensland, our lead Queensland Senate candidate. Hi, Campbell. G'day. G'day, everyone. And we have John Ruddick, our lead Senate candidate in New South Wales. Uh, John, Hi, how are you? Can, can I, I got an email this morning from a friend of mine who is a Papua New Guinean Highland villager. And he told me that him and his village love Liberty Chat. Well, that's excellent because I lived there as a kid for three years and that's where my Libertopia is. When I can escape Australia, I'm off yeah, back to New right. Guinea. Yes. Yeah, uh, I'm going to live in the jungle in, in New Guinea again and be free. Um, and as you can see, our, um, our now lead Senate candidate in Victoria is not here tonight. Mr. David Limbrick has been very busy, but we do have one of his very excellent staffers here in Mr. Ash Blackwell. How are you, Ash? I'm tired. <laughs> it's, well, it's you been might a long, need to explain. Long week. Yeah, you might need to explain why. And well, David's not here because he's been working literally night and day uh, fighting this hideous pandemic bill under the Andrews government here in Victoria. But uh, Ash, do you want to give us a little bit of an update and, and what's going on there? Yeah, well, I'll come back to why David isn't here. He sends his apologies. He, he would have liked to have been. Um, but maybe I'll start with the other big thing that happened over the last week. And that was a, another very big protest in um, Melbourne on Saturday. So we had, um, David was down there and we had an excellent team of volunteers from the Liberal Democrats. Um, had some cool uh, banners, um, people were handing out flyers, uh, a whole crew in Liberal Democrats t-shirts, which was great. And, um, you know, for David uh, had the opportunity to speak to some media and just the whole day for, for hours nonstop, people were just coming up and expressing gratitude, um, you know, support for David and the Liberal Democrats and appreciation because, um, you know, he's, he's been there uh, from the get-go going out and speaking to protesters, yeah. understanding what people's concerns are and reflecting them back in the parliament and speaking on behalf of those people. So he, he's literally mobbed like a rock star now. Yeah, um, which is also overwhelming. So, you know, we, we stayed at the protest for a few hours and, and then that, that was enough for David. He was, <laughs> he was ready to take a break after that and save his energy for um, the, the big battle over the pandemic legislation that yes. happened well, it's in some ways still underway. Yes. Um, so I'm sure, you know, probably probably everyone um, watching has some idea what we're talking about, but um, I, I suppose a, a brief review. Back in um, April, the emergency powers here in Victoria uh, had a limit on them under the Initial Enabling Act. And last year that was extended for six months and that was a very intense vote and um, debate. And then we got to April and it was extended again. And, you know, uh, David and Tim, the Liberal Democrats opposed that. We felt that, um, you know, they'd, they'd had long enough to come up with uh, some kind of framework to manage the pandemic in line with the values of a liberal democracy. So in some ways, we wanted them to come up with some kind of alternative legislation. And over the last six months, the government has been negotiating with the three crossbenchers who supported them on the previous extensions of the state of emergency. And a couple of weeks back, brought a bill to the chamber. Um, you know, we thought it was a pretty rubbish bill, but we were also jo joined in that critique by a whole range of legal experts and independent organizations across the community. Liberty Victoria, the Law Institute, um, the Center for Independent Studies, the Human Rights Law Center, 60 QCs writing an open letter. There was a lot of criticism of basically the outcome after the government had had um, nearly 20 months to consider, draft, work on, consult on a bit of legislation. What they came to the chamber with mm. was completely unsatisfactory to most people. Yes, They were a bit, um, uh, how could you put it, maybe a little bit um, cocky uh, <laughs> because they believed that they were still going to get the legislation through. They had the vote, so they didn't talk to anyone else and tried to just rush it through. Mm. And then like some twist in a, in a Netflix, you know, when you get to series three, you need to keep it lively. Um, Adam Somurek, the former Labor minister in the government, 
submitted his vaccination details, which signalled that he would be returning to Parliament, and everything went into panic. The bill was no longer considered urgent, and the government um, were hurrying to try and adjourn it off. Um, and so they did that, and Adam came out and spoke to the media and, you know, had some criticisms. Um, whether that was, uh, you know, there was some degree of motivation um, from, you know, angst between him and his former party, which booted him out. That's something that some people have said. Yeah, but well, certainly Patrick, his argument Patrick was that... Patrick in the chat um, says, uh, never doubt the power of spite. Well, perhaps, but, you know, he, he has had good things to say on civil liberties in the past, even before all the branch stacking stuff. Um, certainly his argument was that if he was in cabinet within the government still, he would have argued against it because mm -hmm. he would be scared of a future Liberal government that had the same powers. Yes. And that's kind of the lens that we as libertarians look at all policy through, right? What What's the worst that could happen with this law in the hands of the most terrible government you could imagine? Mm. That's how you get to the meaning of what, what laws and rules are actually getting passed. Like, well you know, said. what is what is the worst and most horrendous overreach yes. that would be possible yes. with this law? Um, so it was adjourned off and they went back to the, the drawing board. They had to negotiate with some other crossbenchers um you know there was a lot of pressure from the community we you know we've been getting dozens and dozens of calls a day david's been getting hundreds of emails a day from yes. people all over the community that have various concerns about the bill you know and a range of things certainly one of the most frequent ones is people concerned about um the vaccine mandates the broad vaccine mandates and the vaccine segregation policy of the government you know that's locking people out of work and it's locking them out of society um so to the reason why david sends his apologies this evening that <laughs> debate of the amended bill after the government secured one more vote occurred um well it started yesterday on tuesday i think about one o'clock and mps were except for a couple of meal breaks on their feet debating the bill for about 25 hours um and david and tim were in the chamber pretty much the whole time um, grilling the government about how the bill was supposed to work, um, arguing and, and, you know, calling votes on uh, different amendments. Mm. Um, I suppose uh, one more explainer and then I'll, I'll, I'll hand back to Kirsty. The, the part of the debate uh, that they were at is called the Committee of the Whole, and that's where you get to ask questions about how the law is supposed to work. So if there's a future legal case, a judge can take that into consideration when interpreting, you know, not just the letter of the, the law as it's written, but how the government have explained it's um, supposed to work. So it can be really important to get certain things on the record, mm. um, you know, besides just opposing the bill and, and you know, trying to um, uh, be successful in the vote. So the stage that the bill is at as of um, Tuesday evening, at, uh, at uh, sorry, Wednesday evening at uh, 7.30 odd, um, because it has things to do with appropriations, budget uh, measures in it, it can't be simply passed by the upper house. That has to go back to the legislative assembly. Mm. They have to accept those amendments and then send it back to the legislative council again, which mm. will happen tomorrow. So we expect that um, by this time tomorrow, the, the bill will have passed and then it becomes law. And then we see you know, what the promises of the government are worth. <laughs> Certainly we're quite sceptical of their reassurances yes. over transparency and various other things. Uh, it's really quite crazy. And I see a lot of people commenting going, you know, epic effort by David and Tim. And, and I spoke to David a few hours ago and he said he was starting to hallucinate because he'd just been awake <laughs> and in Parliament. So thank you so much, Ash, for uh, joining us. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I, I barged in on you, John. Were you trying to say oh, something? I was just going to ask Ash, is there any hope? Or is, is there no hope? There, look, the, the, I, I don't think there's any hope of anyone changing their vote. So it would be, you know, like an act of nature, you know, some kind of um, unforeseen, very unlikely circumstance that, that could defeat the, the bill at this stage, I think. Mm. Now, the other thing that we need to talk about, obviously, Ash, is David's announcement of running as a Senate candidate, as our, and now our lead candidate here in Victoria. Um, 
a lot of people have been asking, like, how will that affect his chance of voting? Like, if that's been announced, what what kind of happens logistically there? And obviously, when he goes into campaign mode, what happens then with his role as a state uh, MP? Yeah, so um, uh, I'm not um, I'm not the the lead expert on this. I think um, you know, there's probably some other people that could be more precise. But my understanding is that um, when the elections called the federal election. He then resigns from the Victorian Parliament and his seat becomes vacant for the period of the, the campaign until there's a result. Now, that seat can be held for him for, for that time. The party could reappoint somebody else, but that's not the intention. Um, the intention is that David would return to the Parliament. He feels unsuccessful in the Senate. Um, there is... Um, there is a possibility that there could be a vote during that period. We don't know, you know, how it's going to line up in terms of um, match up with the sitting weeks here in Victoria. Okay. It's a very, very rare thing that um, David's vote alone would be uh, the critical vote on any piece of yeah. legislation. Um, you know, always, you know, he would have he would prefer to be available to vote, but you know, there may be that small period where he's not there, um, and then if he's successful. Um, the party would appoint another person to fill his spot. It's not like the um, lower house where you need to go to a by-election. The party just has the op uh, option of choosing another person and nominating them to fill his seat. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's certainly there have been people sort of wondering, everyone's kind of wanting David uh, to run for the Senate, but also still kind of worried about his, his spot here uh, on the state. Um, well, the other thing to remember is that he would then be a Victorian senator. So it's yeah. not like he wouldn't be still representing Victoria. That's right. That's He'd right. just be taking the, the voice of Victorians to the federal parliament. Yes. Well, thank you so much, Ash, for joining us. We will let you go off and have a nap now or a proper sleep. Thank you so much, Ash. We'll no worries. Thanks, Kirsty. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for today. Now, um, before we go to our guests, because we're going to like lead off that same story, and I've, I've got a question here um, in in our chat box, and, and I'm going to ask it to Campbell. I think you might be the best here. It's from Alex, and he's saying, I'm seeing a lot of frustrating comments online from people suggesting that a vote for a minor party is a wasted vote. How can we educate the people to understand the preferential voting system? I thought this kind of ties in with the fact that, you know, we're talking about obviously voting for uh, various Senate candidates. How does this kind of work? Well, look, the, there's going to be a line run. It's already been run by the coalition that uh, which is which is even worse, it's a step further on, that um, a vote for a minor party means that you get Anthony Albanese. So I've been working against that for some time and my appearances on Sky News. And my sort of whole thing is that that is firstly a scare campaign. Uh, but the, the sort of uh, thought process I'm trying to get across to people is that, you know, we're going to be advocating a vote one for the Liberal Democrats, vote to for the UAP and then there'll be other preferences, the preference agreements with other parties uh, numbering down and ultimately you, you get to the coalition. Um, that way you've got the best chance of getting new blood into the parliament, a minor party, hopefully the Lib Dems is number one um, or one of the other parties. But ultimately, um, if none of those minor party candidates get gets up, you end up with uh, you know, the coalition. And I, I assume most people participating in this would see that as a good outcome. I'm, I'm prepared to understand and respect that some people might see it a bit differently. But that's, you know, that's the biggest argument um, that we have to combat, in my humble opinion, because, you know, let's face it, many of the people we're trying to get are disaffected Liberal mm. or National Party voters. Mm. And, you know, we have got to deal with this issue. So, you know, it's really an argument about if you want change, you have to go for the you know for the Lib Dem uh, or other minor party candidates up front, and mm. you, know, you can get change. And you know, um, as John Ruddock has said, he's given us the example in a previous um, episode of Liberty Chat about what happened uh, in Canada. These things can change. Parties can die, wither on the vine, and die. And 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 this is this is what we're proposing is renewal. Mm -hmm. would, you like me to, would you like me to quickly talk about the last week? Yeah, well, let, let's go to that now whilst you're, well, whilst you're just, talking. Just, just to cover off that, continue yeah. on. So, so last week I provided apologies 
um, everyone, I provided a, a video <laughs> from the car park. It was a great video. So, well, thank you. It's, it's, it's very <laughs> generous of you, Kirsten. It's from the car park of the Surfers Paradise Golf Club. Uh, <laughs> and it was just to explain the Clive Palmer agreement. And I hope people have digested that. But look, this has been well received. Mm. Uh, and uh, you know, I've had a few comment, negative comments about it. Um, but the bottom line is, if, um, if, if we want to succeed, we have to have this agreement and other agreements. And I can assure people, not that it's my decision, it's the executive's position, but the feedback I get from John Humphreys is that we will be countenancing other deals like this. And by the way, members have said, I'm sure John's had it. Um, I know I have. Uh, both members and people from the public have said, please work together with the other minor parties. Don't beat yeah. each other up. You know, work together, have some sort of alliance even. Um, so so that I get I get countless emails about it every single day. So anyway, there was a meeting that night at the Service Paradise uh, Golf Club, which the um, uh, Gold Coast branch facilitated. They do a, did a fantastic job. Uh, mm. There were well over 200 people um, yeah. and it was it was standing room only. And uh, I thought the evening went went particularly well. Uh, other things that have happened um, since then, I participated in a TTF conference. So there's a mob called Tourism Transport Futures who are sort of a peak lobby group. They had a conference, which I attended virtually last Friday. I was interviewed by David Spears, got to talk about a lot of the Lib Dems policies, which um, I don't know they were well received by the very corporate audience. Um, but given the tourism industry is really about mainly about small business, I, I thought they, um, I thought it was good anyway for, for that, that group to know about them. Uh, mm. I've also done Paul Murray Live on Sunday night. I've done Credlin uh, last night. Um, I did an interview with Force, an extended interview with Force CA in Cairns, which has then been widely um, listened to on, on their sort of uh, streaming service. Mm. Uh, on Sunday, I attended and spoke at a Sunshine Coast uh, rally uh, put on by nurses, mm -hmm. which probably had at least 400, probably about 500 people attending. There'd That's been a brilliant. rally the previous day at Cotton Tree on the Sunshine Coast as well. Um, but this was a pretty good attendance given that that had happened. All yeah. these things have been about really about vaccine mandates, yes. about opposing vaccine coercion. Uh, we've been pretty busy on social media pushing on those issues, but uh, also starting to try and promote other parts of the Freedom Manifesto. Mm -hmm. So if you're following me on um, Twitter or Facebook or Instagram, you'll see these, we're starting to put these tiles up, which actually take a particular aspect of the policy and pop it up. So one that we put up this afternoon, only about two hours ago, which was calling for a Royal Commission uh, into the COVID response, um, that's going off like a rocket. They look great right too, and yeah. they're really easy to share. And yeah, so they, they, they get, sharing them. They get they get attention. And I think yeah. that's a big thing. And that one, we probably need to revisit that one. But I guess I'll just make this final point that um, that um, the PM had a very bad week last week. Uh, that was evident, and the, it's interesting to note his response to that because. The election, as far as he's concerned, he's going to be trying to fight this on national security, economic management, believe it or not. And I've loved some of the stuff that John's been, that you've been punching out about, pointing out about the debt and all that sort of stuff. So much for that. And of course, they've kept us safe. So forget the civil liberties issues, forget vaccine coercion, which he hasn't jumped on, even though he says he's against it. it it's they've kept us safe. So. We need to be thinking about that. We need to be you know, watching as the game changes. We, we, we need to push the things that we want to on the civil liberties front and on the vaccine coercion front. But we do need to be ahead of the game, not playing yesterday's game as he tries to take this in a new territory. But he ends the parliamentary year pretty, looking pretty shabby. Yeah. Uh, and, oh, the other thing they're trying very hard to do, if you've been observing it closely, is they have been belting up Albanese. Um, and I'm afraid he hasn't covered himself in glory as well. He, he should have been more professional, particularly yesterday, in dealing with some of those uh, attacks on, on his character.
Uh, I can hear uh, Campbell, your little doggo yeah, in the background. Oh, no, no, I have to go mute. Yeah, that's, that's well, I hope it's your dog and not some sort of weird uh, it's, it's, gut issue that you may it's, have. It's 6.51 p.m. here in wholesome godlike time <laughs> um, and, and the dog's got the zoomies. So. Uh, that's it. I also saw you did um, a really cool little interview with the gel blasters because obviously that's been something that the party has been talking about for a while and, and um, we did a big uh, gel blasting event up there last year and my son was wrapped because of course it's banned down here in Victoria but a lot of fun in Queensland. Uh, Christopher here says Cam that you are a machine and you've been working very very hard. Uh, Wade Cox who is actually the Sunshine Coast branch convener says the march on Saturday on the Sunshine Coast had probably 2,000 attendees um, and that's pretty epic for you know laid back Sunshine Coast area it's it's, it's awesome. Um, okay, so let's move on to our wonderful guests. We have, going back to talking a little bit about David Limbrick running for the Senate, we have his two leading ladies here tonight, Crystal Mitchell and Carolyn White, who are number two and number three on the Senate ticket, respectively. Welcome, ladies. Thank you. It's ladies' night on Liberty Chat. <laughs> now, now this has just been announced. Obviously, Crystal, you've been on Libby Chat before. You are our first return guest, I will add. So thank you. It is a great honor. <laughs> you will be bestowed with much good vibes. Um, but a lot has changed in those few weeks. A lot has changed because when we saw you last, you had only just very publicly uh, resigned from Big Poll. Uh, obviously, a lot has changed. We go and then Carolyn, of course. Uh, has been involved in the party for a little while now after some issues with her business with lockdowns and so it's wonderful to have two really accomplished beautiful smart women as our as our candidates for Victoria but Crystal how about a little bit of an update on what you have been doing in the last few weeks yeah so thanks uh really appreciate uh, the opportunity to come back to Liberty Chat so thanks for having me from episode three uh, as a recently new member, um, as a general member of the Liberal mm. Democratic Party, to episode eight and running for the Senate as a candidate. What, what a whirlwind. <laughs> In the federal election. What a whirlwind indeed. Mm. Um, I think it just goes to show you how fast paced things are really happening mm. in Victoria at the moment um, and that drive uh, from the people to see significant change. Um, at all levels of government. Um, you know, a lot of questions I guess I've, I've had over the last couple of weeks um, and especially after the announcement, because obviously, you know, there were some people in the background that were like, oh, we heard that you, you know, you're sort of stepping up into politics, what's going on there? And, um, you know, the fact that uh, the federal election is coming up now and a lot of people said well you know why didn't you wait off for the the state election mm -hmm. and sort of the response to that is that um obviously i made inquiries uh, whilst i was still a police officer um about what the liberal democratic party stood for because as a police officer i was seeing that degradation of uh separation of state between police and government and i was really concerned at the way that the, that relationship was occurring the way in which the victoria police was being used and uh, wanting to step up in some way to make a change and to make a difference, but not really sure how to do that um, whilst being a police officer. And then obviously, you know, reaching that uh, foregone conclusion of, you know what, I need to stand up, I need to speak out, whatever the consequences may be. Um, and that's then transitioned to where we are now. And the reason why I've um, asked and um, being elected to run as a candidate in the Senate at, at a federal um, election is be, from, from my perspective is I truly believe that the Liberal Democratic Party um, is the future of a major party uh, in Australia in politics and so for that reason we need to see the Liberal Democrats saturate the market at, at every government level uh, mm -hmm. local state and federal because if we want to see the changes that the Liberal Democrats um, profess to, to provide the Australian community through um, our 10 policies to save Australia, we need to do that at every level. And, you know, why not go big, go home? So start at the top. Let's affect real change um, in, in Australian politics at a federal level. That's what I want to see. 
that's what I'm passionate about, justice, inequality, uh, fairness. And those are things that I joined the Detroit Police for. And that is just such a transferable passion yes. into the Senate yes. to be able to fight for all Australians. But obviously with that focus of Victoria, my state, my, my home town that I love so much and, and fight for the freedoms that... Um, you know, were bestowed upon us by the people who fought for them before we we, we arrived here. And I want to see a return to those freedoms. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I guess that's, um, you know, that's a bit of the journey from episode three <laughs> to episode eight. Quite um, a journey. Quite a journey. It has been. Um, look, I love our Freedom Manifesto. Um, mm. I think that the the two um, main policies that you know I've seen and had a direct sort of impact um, in um, are free speech mm. and the freedom from surveillance. So free yeah. speech, obviously, for me, um, that ability to um, have that constitutional amendment that we are asking for, which is that Parliament shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. Uh, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech mm. or of the press or the right of the people to peacefully assemble, which is obviously, you know, one of the main reasons that I left Victoria Police was seeing uh, that degradation and inability for people to mm -hmm. have that democratic, basic human right to peacefully protest against their government um, and then obviously the opportunity to redress those grievances mm. so I'm very passionate about that in our manifesto <laughs> the second one that I'm really passionate about is freedom from, from surveillance so a lot of you might not know but whilst I was in the police force I was an intelligence analyst for a number of years and I actually got my degree in intel analysis so I know firsthand in the background how easy it is for um, police forces and other agencies to obtain information. And we do have unnecessary and disproportionate mass surveillance in this country. Mm -hmm. Surveillance is required for certain circumstances. Absolutely, I think we can all agree on that, but we don't need this blanket uh, mass surveillance, especially at this uh, operating at a federal level. Further to that, obviously, is something that Campbell uh, referred to earlier in relation to vaccine passports. That is a form of surveillance. Um, and there's that great concern about, you know, we bring in something for one reason and then that just naturally transcends into something else. And that vaccine passport um, could um, transcend into the social credit system that we see in China. Um, mm -hmm. And that's not unreasonable. That's not a conspiracy theory. That is a, a reasonable progression of that type of technology um, and that's something that we absolutely have to stand out yeah, yeah. Um, well, I've seen that Black Mirror episode um, yes yeah exactly right. very passionate Carolyn how did you end up here what brought you into politics tell us your story um well I was a bit like Crystal in that um everything from that happened since March 2020 the the COVID craziness that's been um has really pushed me into doing this as well um yeah you know biz, small businesses are hard enough as as it is um uh, you know and now it's made near impossible uh, mm. with all of these restrictions we're, we're kind of as business owners um you know we're being forced to do things that we should really not have to do um you know and and while we're being forced to do this we also um you know we're not getting you know the, the government hasn't disclosed any of the, the the science or or the information or the data to us and yet expects us to kind of um be complicit in all of this um com, you know comply with all of their their mandates and their restrictions and um and if we don't now, we're faced with fines that are just extortionate. You know, if when this, this bill goes through, it's like two hundred and fifty thousand dollar fines. If you know, I mean, imagine if one of the teachers didn't have a mask and these authorized officers come in, and it's a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar fine. I mean, it blows my mind. Um, you know, and I've also got a young son, and he's eight years old, uh, and you know, he hasn't been able to get an education for the last two years. Um, he's missed out, you know, on his on his football seasons. And, you know, children should never have missed out on a second of education mm. in all of this. 
um, let alone now, you know, the mandating 12 year olds. I mean, where does it, where does it end? It's just crazy. Um, so yeah. And I felt, I, I just, I've been backed in a, into a corner and I don't have any other option because you know, running a business is now basically not unviable, um, you know, and, and, it, and it's our future and it's our freedom and and we're being bullied here and, and I don't want to mm. be bullied out of my home. I, I want to stay here and I want to fight. I want to yes. fight for our future um, because, you know, we, we lived in the greatest country in the world and we've gone from living in the greatest country in the world in 18 months to it just... <laughs> yeah, just being the place that you don't want to live. Yeah. Um, and I, I think especially for you, like, you know, a young woman starting your own business and building up your, your dance school business along there. And I know, obviously, you know, you were affected by the lockdowns and sort of basically closing your business for so long to teach children to dance, getting them out there doing physical exercise. And you did stage the protest, which was pretty awesome. Um, tell us a little bit about that, because obviously David Limbrick, we had David Limbrick uh, MP doing one of the speeches there as well. So how did how did that happen? How did you sort of think, I'm going to do a protest? I think it was, we were all waiting, um, you know, for these announcements at Daniel Andrews press conferences, because you'd have to sit there and wait and be like, what's my future going to look at, like at midnight tonight? Um, and, you know, and it was that, you know, we've just, dance studios have been so badly discriminated mm. against and that's the only word that you can use for it and, and it continues on. And so, you know, it was that everyone else kind of got to reopen and everything and we were still going to be shut. Wow. And, you know, I'm in a Facebook group with, you know, thousands of other dance studio owners and, um, and then the post started and, and, and was kind of like, um, you know, I just, I think someone mentioned something about a protest and I was like, right, that's it. I was, um, you know, on the phone, um, you know, I, I, I messaged David um, because I'd, I'd been following him since this all started, um, you know, and, and he helped support me with that. Um, and we got the mainstream media there, which is great. And what was really amazing was, that pressure that that created saw change for our for our industry. You know, we weren't they didn't hold us back another week like they were kind of going to. It, it, it ended sooner. These kind of restrictions, which was really good. Um, but yeah, that was a protest. What was interesting though was, um, you know, all of these people, all of these dancers and dance studio owners and and mums and and people wanted to come and support, but they didn't. And that was not because they were scared of the virus, but they mm. were scared of the police brutality that we've witnessed down yeah. here in Victoria. And I mean, these are, you know, mums and dads and dancers and, and, and you know, luckily we got left alone. Um, yeah. because even though the Victoria police at the time, they were kind of saying, don't do it. You know, chief health medical officers, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, no, like, this is going to happen because I need to stand up for what I believe in. Yeah, good on um, you. And they did, they, they ended up lit and leave, but I made it very clear. I was like, you know, it's not really a place where you can behave like that. These are young dancers and these are families. Mm. Um, and that's no, it's not going to be go down like that on, at this protest. Mm. And they kind of, left us alone <laughs> it was very good I and mean, you had uh rukshan there and who needs mainstream media rukshan gets way more views than mainstream media so it was it was very beautiful to watch um and as i remember david limbrick saying the most wholesome protest he's ever seen there's a comment here from tamara saying carolyn my daughter is 13 and has been locked out of her dance school she's danced since she was two years old and was three weeks out from her concert heartbreaking disgusting it's, it is it's disgusting absolutely disgusting yeah. and I'm I'm actually thinking about you know um different industries have written open letters to Daniel Andrews I've all, I've got stance studio owners that are jump on and sign it with me so I have drafted something because 
you know, we need to see a backflip in this and we need to see it, um, you know, happen really quickly. Mm. Children should not be locked out of their extracurricular activity and a minute longer. Mm. Absolutely. Uh, exactly well, right. Carolyn, I went on Matt Wong and I challenged Daniel Andrews to let protests happen without police interference. And then all of a sudden there was no police arresting protesters at protests. So maybe you just need to do something like that. Yeah, and challenge challenge him to it. Who yeah, needs mainstream media? Well, I, I challenged Daniel Andrews to come to my studio and stand at my studio door and turn these kids away from their ballet classes. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's been a thing. I've been the same. My son has, uh, they had about eight rounds of footy last year and that's it. They moved scouts to online. How can you do online scouts? Like it's insane. And so, of course, he lost all interest altogether. Uh, well, thank you so much, ladies, um, for joining us tonight. I am so looking forward to following your campaign. How do we follow you both on social media? Carolyn. I have a Facebook page um, set up, so I'd love you to um, jump onto that. Caroline White, um, Senate candidate for the Liberal mm -hmm. Democrats. Someone will put that in the chat box. Yeah, and I'll set up some Instagram soon. <laughs> you can follow my dance studio Instagram page, which is um, Two Shoes Dance, T-W-O-S-H-O-E-S -S, Dance. Mm -hmm. um, yep, your, well, your Facebook page, your uh, candidate Facebook page is in the chat there. So that's okay. excellent. Thank you. And Laura. Crystal. Yes, I'll pop mine into the chat. I literally, as we were about to jump into Liberty Chat, just started an Instagram and a Twitter account. You would think <laughs> as an analyst that I would have been all over that kind of stuff and all over the socials, but we're actually... Um, we're, turned, we're told to just like stay away from it completely. So now that I'm <laughs> yeah. not in the police force, I can get on there, but I need all of you to jump on. Tell yes. me who I should follow, follow me. Um, apparently I have interesting things to say. So I'll get onto Twitter and I'll make some in interesting and hopefully some controversial comments that you can all share and get the message out about the Lib Dems and what we're doing. I'll post my details in the chat. Please follow me. Thanks guys. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for joining us, ladies. Have a good night. Thanks. Well, we might bring back Campbell and John. Um, they are, they're fantastic candidates. I am so proud, so proud to know them and, and happy to count them as friends as well. They're wonderful, very, they're just excellent candidates all around. It's great to see really passionate young women getting involved in politics as well, because uh, we need it. We need it. Um, now, John, History, yes. history. Let's do it. What have we got? What have you got for us tonight? What's yeah, tonight? Come okay. on, come on. <laughs> well, the, the first history, I, I've got two little ones. Like, the first one is the history of last week. We had a referendum in, um, yeah, look, the most democratic country on earth is Switzerland. They have citizens initiated referendums multiple times a year. They had a citizens initiated referendum last Sunday and 60, and it was on COVID, on, on, you know, on trying to get rid of COVID restrictions. 62% of people in Switzerland voted in favour of it. Okay, now that at face value is disappointing. Yes, it is. But there is two silver linings in it. Firstly, 38% of people uh, said, no, no, we, 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 don't, we don't want any more of this COVID nonsense. Now, that's pretty good because the Swiss media, like the Australian media, like the whole world's media, is you know, shoving it down people's throat. <laughs> uh, and the other very encouraging thing was the polls said 70% to 72% would be in favour of maintaining COVID. But when they had a real vote, it was significantly less. Now, there was a news poll a week or two ago saying that Dan Andrews is going to get re-elected. I truly believe that the, this, this is overstated. I think people, there is an element of fear with this soft police state that we're living in. Not that soft sometimes. <laughs> and, and, and I think that, there, I think that, the, I think that some people some sort of simpler type of people. They get a phone call from an anonymous person, say, do you like Dan Andrews? They say, yeah, 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 I like Dan Andrews. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I'm very inspired by Caroline and Crystal's talks, and I think, you know, let's see. Okay. John, yeah. John just to just interrupt for a second, just on your, 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 your Switzerland stat, I'd make one other important point in support of your argument. Yes. Uh, having a very good friend who's an Australian Swiss uh, national who's actually brought his family back a few months ago to mm -hmm. Australia, and he is bitter about it. And why is he bitter? Because he brought them back 
to Australia thinking it was going to be free. And I, well, it's not. It, it, they, they, their comment is they wish they stayed in Switzerland. The restrictions there they've had on COVID since this thing started have been far more benign than Australia. So, you know, when you're putting that question to people and it's been more benign, you, you would expect that you'd actually have less resistance to the restrictions in the first place. So I just thought that supported what you're saying. No, that all sounds very accurate to me. Yeah. I think I think this Omicron this week. I think it's Omicron. Our best, I think it's, a, it's our best Omicron. Yeah. It's, did we tell you how scared you had to be? Oh, very scary. Uh, look, yeah, and remember, it's an anagram for what? Moronic. <laughs> Moronic. Yes, yes. Isn't this a load of bull dust? I think it's our best friend in that since COVID began, I think Omicron is our best because. So world stock markets went down seven percent or something. They had trillions of dollars of loss. So they're still <laughs> crapping on about it. Okay, John, John, we have to come up with the next variant yes. name. Yes. <laughs> How does it be? Yeah, yes. the, the really scary name. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, mate. I'll shut up. No, you're right. No, 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 about, no, the okay. good thing that I've seen with that, like looking at all the comments on social media and even on the ABC Facebook pages, and they're really scared by everything there. There's a lot of people going, actually, this is enough now. This There's a lot of people that are just like, nah, this is too far. Uh, I've had my double vax and I don't want to have any boosters. Like, this is ridiculous. Let us just live normally. That's what they're saying. I'm cue, seeing a lot of it the now. Phantom, cue the phantom of the opera you know, music. Yes. <laughs> I, I turned into the 6 o'clock Channel 9 news tonight and I thought to myself, surely they won't talk about it again because it's embarrassing oh. now. But I oh, know the first five minutes is all about Omnicrom. Omnicron, whatever. Now, then, but then they had to say towards the end of the report, only six people have got in, in Australia, uh, and only one of those six has had any symptoms, and they were quote very mild. <laughs> so this is our best friend. I promise you, this is this is going to help uh, get rid of uh, COVID mania more than anything else. <laughs> okay. Now I have to say, Kirsty, that when I go to these freedom marches, which are an enormous amount of fun, to, yeah. besides saving our country. They are fun. Uh, people come up to me and they love the Liberty Chat and it's very they encouraging. They and do. I, and I, I know a lot of people watch this on YouTube. We have, the Liberal Democrats in Sydney have the best after party for the after the Freedom March. So you've got to become a member. That doesn't take much of an effort to become a member. That's if right. You, if you come, if you become a member of the Liberal Democrats in, in, in New South Wales, you attend the Sydney Freedom March, you are then welcome back to our, 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 our after party. And I promise you, it's the best after party that it happens after the Freedom March. So become a member of the Liberal Democrats, please. And come and join us at the Freedom March. Well, I mean, Sydney had to compete with the Gold Coast now having more than 200 people at a, at a branch event. So uh, we'll see. I saw those photos with our wonderful candidate, Diane, and uh, mm. it was a very impressive, Cam. A lot of, yes. There's still a lot of people out there that love Campbell Newman, no doubt about that. That's right. Okay. Now, the blistery history. Uh, <clears throat> One of the things that, uh, that I notice when people come up to me and talk to me about blistery history is they have oft, very often young people, which is terrific. Now, these, these are people that are often born in the 1990s or even later. Okay, so therefore, uh, they may not know about the glorious decade known as the 1980s. <laughs> now, now the, the, there really was something Point beautiful order. that happened. <laughs> I object. Okay. okay. The fashion was terrible. It wow. was. The music was great. Well, look, again, please carry on. <laughs> well, we did we did defeat a little thing called communism in that decade, Campbell, which sort of does <laughs> outweigh your fashion sense. Uh, look, in the 60s and the 70s, the West, led by America, was in a tough, tough place. There was five failed presidencies, starting with the you know, very unfortunate assassination of President Kennedy. And that really was sort of a bad omen for America, uh, that assassination. And then, you know, you had uh, Lyndon Johnson didn't run again and Richard Nixon had to resign and Gerald Ford was under there for a little while. And Jimmy Carter was hopeless. He was in this malaise. He referred to himself as being in a malaise. And there was inflation. There was bad economy. There was an oil shock. America lost its first war, uh, the first time it had ever lost a war, the Vietnam War, which really was, America was really trying to fight for the South Vietnamese to make them a democracy like Japan and Taiwan and South Korea and it, you know, it didn't go it didn't go to plan it was very very sad still sad for the South Vietnamese today but America yeah all over the TV lost a war a big war no question about it 
And it was similar in, in most of the Western world. I mean, Britain had very un, un, underwhelming prime ministers in the 60s and 70s. Uh, you know, and Harold Wilson was a Labour prime minister in the 60s in, in the UK. And he was, you know, uh, people have said he was a, basically a communist, a communist spy. And we had Gough Whitlam and the dismissal. There, there was a lot. And I remember there was a Time magazine uh, front cover in, in about nine, early 1979. And it, it, had, it had the Soviet bear looking really strong and the American eagle looking really weak. And it really looked, and the, the, the Russians were, you know, going into Afghanistan and everything. Now, then the glorious 80s actually started in May 1979 when Margaret Thatcher came along and became the Prime Minister of Britain. That really was the beginning of the turnaround. Now, something that happens with democracies is there is a price with a democracy is that most democratic leaders are dull and boring. But that's better than the alternative, which is a dictatorship, which often the dictators are very charismatic and charming and everything, but evil. But, uh, but you, once a generation... In a democracy, you have a magnificent leader, roughly. And what happened in the West in the 1980s, we had this confluence. It was almost like a divine act. We had this, we had a series all around the world of magnificent leaders. And I want to go through them. This is particularly for the young people. Now we had in America the great Ronald Reagan. Okay, now Ronald Reagan, I have I, I hope I'm not going to offend some religious people out there, but I've often debated who is the greatest person in history, Jesus Christ or Ronald Reagan. And he, and if you just watch him on YouTube, he was just a magnificent person. Now, who have we got today? We've got Joe Biden, who is the anti-Reagan, just a complete joke. He hasn't got any brains. He's a bad person. Miranda Devine has written this book about his son's life. He's an absolute crook. He stole the election, in my view. And, you know, and Reagan is this magnificent, cute person. But it wasn't just... Like, well, I want to, there's this contrast between the 1980s and now. And yes, it's a bit grim now, but my point is it's going to get better. Now, then we had in, in Britain, we had the magnificent Margaret Thatcher, you know, who, who was Reagan's equal. And the two of them, the two of them had been friends for about, about eight years before they both became leaders. And they became leaders at about the same time and they gave each other support. Now, now we have in Britain, we have Boris Johnson, who's meant to be from the conservative side of the Conservative Party, but who is basically a mess. And, uh, you know, and, and you know, he used to be the editor of The Spectator and he used to say good things there. But I mean, he's just completely sold out on global warming and on COVID. And, you know, it's just he, he's, he's the total. He used to say how much he loved Ronald Reagan. Now, then another leader that we had in the 80s was the Pope. And I'm not a Catholic, but gee, we had a great Pope in the 1980s. This guy was from Poland and he was an anti-communist. And having a Polish Pope, the communists, the Russians, the, the Soviets used to invade Eastern European countries that had a revolt against communism. But when they had a big anti-communist called this Pope uh, from Poland, they couldn't touch him. The Soviets knew that they couldn't touch him. And he was a really great man in every way. And he loved Reagan and Thatcher. And now we have, now we have this new Pope uh, who I completely despise and who... Sometimes, I'm not even sure if he believes in God, but he sure does believe in. Uh, he sure does believe in communism. Okay, now then, in, in good old Australia, the best country in the world in the 1980s, we had a Labor leader, and he was one of Australia's greatest prime ministers. His name was Bob Hawke. Now, what was so great about Bob Hawke, besides him being a very cool dude and a very, very laric and very Aussie type of bloke, he was a Rhodes Scholar. He was highly intelligent. But the best thing about Bob Hawke is. He betrayed everything the Labor Party ever stood for. Thatcher comes to power in 1979. Bob Hawke comes to power in 1983. By this stage, the Reagan and Thatcher revolutions have really started to bear fruit. And Hawke came along and he said, well, I'm going to betray everything that the Labor Party ever stood for, which was democratic socialism, and I'm going to embrace Thatcherism. And that's what he did. And the Australian economy boomed. And mm -hmm. so good old Bob Hawke. And now we have uh, now we have in Australia ScoMo, you know, who doesn't appear to have ever read a book in his life. He's a fast talker, the old ScoMo. He's never short of a word. Tony Abbott used to mumble his words at press conferences and stuff. But Tony Abbott is a very bright person. The average person doesn't know it, but he is a very bright person, a very intellectual person. Tony Abbott. This ScoMo is the opposite. He's a total dope, but he's a real quick talker. He's never short of a word, okay? But he's got no depth to it. The old ScoMo. Similar in New Zealand. In New Zealand, they had a prime minister called the David Longy, who also, like Bob Hawke, was Labor, 
he completely sold out what the, what the New Zealand Labor Party stood for, just like Bob Hawke did, and he was a very successful Prime Minister. Now, who have we got? We've got the former Vice President of the International Socialist Association, silly little Jacinda. Uh, you know, look, uh, one thing we can say about Jacinda, she was blessed with a beautiful, fantastic smile. And that, a smile gets you a long way in politics, unfortunately. Uh, but, you know, she is a hard left person. She's basically Dan Andrews and her love of lockdownism. And, and it's, it's not helping the New Zealand economy. Now, the other, uh, just one other country, uh, two, two others I want to talk about. In the 1980s, there was a prime minister of, uh, of, of uh, Canada, another very important country, but Brian Mulroney, who was like basically Ronald Reagan's right-hand man as well in, in combat, uh, defeating the communists. And a great guy who brought about economic reform. Now we've got silly Justin Trudeau, uh, who you know, <clears throat> who only got there because his daddy was the prime minister. But his daddy was a very his daddy was the equivalent of Gough Whitlam in Canada in the seventies. Germany, which is a very important country, uh, you know, uh, particularly in the Cold War, they had a magnificent guy there called Helmut Kohl. And now we've just we've just finished up with Angela Merkel, who's meant to be from the right side of politics in Germany, but she's basically sold out on everything. Anyway, my point is this. Things look really grim right now. Uh. There aren't many great leaders around the world right now. However, these things go in cycles. Well, let's hope that, you know, we, this is what the Liberal Democrats are about, trying to turn the cycle around. If we don't turn it around, you know, gee, we're on a, we are on a downward trajectory. But yeah. the 1980s gives us hope that we can come off a low point and we can give humanity a better future. Well, I'm glad you added in that last line because it was getting really depressing there for a while, <laughs> JR. Um, I can't believe I didn't have my Maggie Thatcher mug here tonight. I've got uh, the old Richmond Football Club here. Normally, I like to use my IPA plug for IPA, uh, Margaret mug. Uh, yeah, it's well, very, I mean, very, very, very depressing, John. It was very depressing. It was very depressing because it's a uh, <laughs> well. I guess these things go in cycles. And yes, that's, let's hope. Let's hope. Look, what will, look, they, will they do? Well, you, well, you were mate, that was part of your point, mate. I mean, you were saying yeah. that. There were some, you know, there were duds around uh, in the 60s and 70s. Yes. Uh, particularly the 70s. And, you know, I think these things do come in cycles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, as, uh, oh, Les says I've got, it had a great mug. And yes, Tigers, he loves my Tigers mug. So that's a great. But by Thanks, the way, by, by the way, isn't it another, just, just as a quick small point, isn't it another reflection of, um, how bad the Liberal Party has gone that they cannot even speak up with confidence about iconic people like Reagan and Thatcher, as we saw yes. in the last couple of years with, with some interviews. Yeah, so, exactly. Well, you, you know, you know what, Campbell, about, about, about sort of three months into uh, COVID mania, Josh Frydenberg gave a speech or some, he just said to some journalist off the record, he said, oh, just sort of casually, he said, Oh, yeah, we want to get back to, once this is all over, we want to get back to Reaganism and Thatcherism. Again, that made a few headlines. ScoMo came out and publicly attacked him, attacked his treasurer for saying we should be like Reagan and yeah, Thatcher. That's what that I was, was alluding to, yeah. And, and, um, then, and then Frydenberg, and of course Frydenberg didn't believe it, but at least Frydenberg had the political nows to sort of pretend he supports Reagan, Reagan and Thatcher. ScoMo doesn't even realise how important they are. They built yeah, the modern yeah, world. Now, John, we've got a comment here from Greg who said, goes, no mention of John Howard, question mark, question mark. Oh. What, so what do you, what do you reckon? Uh, I'm, I might have a go, leading with my chair. You go, you go Kevin. I mean, you I, go. look, I, I hold John Howard in, 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 in high regard. Um, and I think, I think he did some pretty important things and at times courageous things. And he was the last one that was prepared to stand up and, and actually put forward a potentially unpopular election losing policy, um, but then prosecute it. Having said that, I would say as well that some of the things that we're against, the, and which we talk about in the Freedom Manifesto, which is about middle-class welfare, where we tax people at a high rate like this, and then the generous and benevolent government then gives them back all this, these allowances, et cetera. Um, he had a lot to do with that really entrenching that stuff. So what, what do you reckon, John? There was two John Howards as Prime Minister. He had four terms. In his first two terms, 
particularly his first term, he was extremely gutsy. He was like that. In his first budget, he cut 10% of all government departments bar defence. That's where the Liberal Democrats got their policy from, thank you very much, John Howard in his first budget. <laughs> he was like Campbell Newman in Campbell Newman's first budget, okay? <laughs> and then, then, then what happened was Howard got absolutely freaked out by Pauline Hanson. It's hard to describe how big Pauline was in 96, 97, 98. And Howard came along with the GST really to sort of as a diversion because Howard had promised no more, no, no, you know, never, ever, never, ever. Okay. Mm. But look, in the first two terms, and they did the waterfront, which took a lot, <clears throat> lot, lot of guts. Now, then it changed with 9-11 as so many... So many things changed with 9-11, all for the bad. You know, so Osama wanted to hurt the West, and he did hurt the West, because after 9-11, you're precisely right, Campbell. The focus was on the war on terror, understandably. Yeah, OK. Uh, uh, but then, but then he, he gave up on the, strong, on the gutsy economic reform stuff. And now, look, the other thing I have to say about how does this, why hasn't he spoken out about COVID mania? Mm. Because, uh, he, he's, a, uh, he's an elder statesman. He could have come out and said, we're overreacting, we're going too far, and he hasn't. I hear that he's actually supportive of it all. That's yeah. disappointing. Well I, well, I know another former prime minister who probably could have been more outspoken, but, but he's appalled by what's happened too. So, mm. yeah, it's interesting. Um, well, it's sounds, interesting that sounds support, very interesting. Right? <laughs> maybe, maybe, well, well, maybe with how with Howard. I mean, I mean, I, you know, this is a bit pre presumptuous for me to say it, but I mean, it could be the fact that he 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 he's the age that he is, and he, you know, and, yeah. and a lot of the people uh, who are older in the community are very concerned about COVID because they're in well, they see themselves in the firing line. Yes, but uh, I know what my late mother, who was a, a colleague of John's, um, my late mother would be absolutely disgusted that. Uh, young people in the community were sort of putting their lives on hold while to protect people like her. She'd have said, mm. she'd have met, well, I can put it like this, she'd have, she'd have met the risk and her potential death with, with courage. Mm. She wouldn't have caught this crap. I agree. Yeah. I agree. There was, um, going back to ScoMo, uh, well, actually, as Rob says, we talk, you were talking about 80s, 80s prime ministers or, or leaders and comparing to now, hence why you didn't mention John Howard in, in blistery history. Um, but there's also a great uh, quarterly essay a couple of months ago called Top Blokes that was a, a ripping yarn about ScoMo. And um, that was a really good read if anyone can look that up. It's the quarterly essays that are obviously out quarterly, free on Audible, cheap at every new agency. It was a, a really good story about kind of Scott Morrison running more as a, as a marketer and changing his whole personality in terms of trying to get where he is and um, and failing quite miserably. Um, well, anything else we need to add tonight, gentlemen? I think we've had another. It, it, this hour has whizzed by really fast. Yeah, my, my only comment is, as it always is, is, you know, follow, tweet, retweet, like, yes. share, Talk to your neighbours, talk to work colleagues, be a pain in the backside, recruit people, you know, every single, you know, extra person who gets on board is, 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 is someone who can then talk to another 100 people, ultimately yes. reach them through social, the power of social media. This at this time is a social media campaign. I mean, yes. I think right. we've got billboards up around Queensland at the moment. We did radio ads of a month or two ago we're doing all that stuff but social media is where it's yes because, you know the mainstream media they they give us limited coverage exactly well and even talking about going back to Rukshan and talking about mainstream media uh David Limbrick's uh senate announcement with Crystal and Carolyn within two hours on Rukshan's live stream there was like nearly 150,000 views within two hours in contrast the announcement by um, the UAP with Clive Palmer and Campbell Newman. I'd have thought that was fairly newsworthy, not to sound like a pretentious tosser, yeah. uh, but I'd have thought that was fairly newsy. Well, just so viewers, you know, this evening from other states would know, um, Queenslanders might have noticed it, but, you know, two, two rather controversial figures, newsworthy figures. Mm -hmm. um, that night on the ABC Brisbane News or the Queensland News, it got mentioned in passing, it did yeah. not be covered. Yep. That's what they're going to do to us on the ABC. It yeah. just got mentioned in passing. You wouldn't have known really what it was about. It was just yeah. 
That's right. Yeah, well, so, mm. we are also doing our fundraising at the moment to make our videos of each policy in the Freedom Manifesto. So that is in the works. Um, obviously, we want everyone to donate towards that. And you can get to our website, ldp.org.au. It'll be slash donate. Um, we really want to get these videos out. We're just doing little clips of each one to explain the policies much faster. So they're going to be really easy to share on your social media, share it with your friends and family, share it with strangers, share it all over the place. Um, obviously, John and Campbell are both have their Facebook pages, their Twitter feeds are both very active on Twitter. So make sure you're following them all there. And obviously, David Limbrick as well. And every other candidate we have going around. So we've got a whole much, whole lot more announcements coming out and some more excellent candidates. But certainly, yes, join the party, ldp.org.au. Donate, volunteer. We need helpers all over the place to get the party started, essentially, even though we've been here for 20 years. Um, thank you, gentlemen, for joining us tonight. Thank you to our other wonderful guests, Carol and Crystal and Ash. Hopefully, Ash is already asleep by now. Um, We'll see you all again next week. Thanks, Kirsty. See you, Cam. Cheers, Mike.